not on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> this is our annual family of eight get together for BCF Midwest. And uh, it's a time to talk about what people have been doing, and you guys should be doing the same thing. So I don't know if you want to come up front and pull your chairs around or whatever. It's just a, a discussion time. So you've got the newest item, I think, right? The newest fake item? Yeah. 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 As in the, the, the by the V8. Right. right. And? And? And I've heard there's an 11. Oh, there's a new horn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so I finished uh, last year after much suffering. Uh, I finished the, the Piney P11 replica, and the suffering was, uh, was to do with the, the, the injection molding of the case, which turned out to be, for a newbie in that area, to be a very painful process. But it's, it's done, so I received the box with 100, 180 cases uh, two weeks ago. And that's at least the... three better than the Piney P8, correct? Yeah, 3.0 better. Yeah. 3.0 better, okay. However, if the, you know, more is not always better. So why do they ship? I don't know, I, I, I've got to uh, polish up the firmware because there's a couple of LEDs that do not blink as they are intended. Um, and I need to respin the circuit board a bit so that people can just screw it together simple. If you know. Yeah, <laughs> I'm away from home for the next uh, three weeks and then one more week and it's, uh, it's done, finally. Yeah. And maybe it's on to the piney beat then. Taking orders? <laughs> no, but you just send me an email if you're interested. Uh, yeah. Or just send money. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, yep. that's, 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 that's it. Okay. And the, the, the PHP time will be the next one. Yeah, yeah that is my, my, my point of an obsession a little bit. I think it's, uh, you know, maybe 16 bits is not enough for everyone. So if you do a 60% size, it will still be this big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> shipping, shipping seems to be the same, uh, shipping cost seems to be the same, right? It goes by weight, so yeah. it's a, it could be a bit bigger. Well, and, and it's important to double the price each, even with each new generation. Oh, the, the price should be correlated with the bits. No, I don't know. <laughs> as long as there's a pie inside, then... Uh, Although there's one interesting thing. Uh, there's a fellow Dutchman called Sietz van Sloten who developed the PDP 2011 uh, over the last few years. And that's a very, very pretty, pretty thing because it's purely FPGA-based, but it's remarkably uh, yeah, robust. It's, it's really what it should be. And so I'm uh, hoping indeed that he will uh, make it connectable to, the, to my PyDP front panel. So you can either check in a, a Py if you're cheap, mm -hmm. like me, or you can put in a, an FPGA for the nice. semi-real semi experience. Mm -hmm. Mike, do you want to talk about what you're doing with FPGA at this point? I really worked on it for six months or so. Yeah, so uh, I started a project several years ago when I was working on uh, for doing an uh, emulator that's uh, uh, partially a PGA, partially ARM, Cortex M3 based uh, peripheral emulator. Because half the time when you go looking for one of these machines, they kept the processor because it's got switches and blinky lights and throw the rest of the machine away, mm -hmm. so you get no peripherals. Yep. So, uh, Microsoft makes an FPGA that has an ARM Cortex M3 component performer, it's a hard core. Mm -hmm. And it's got SPI, I squared C, and Ethernet, and LIIO on the arm. Uh, so I put the paper tape reader would be a good place to start. Mm -hmm. And took pretty much the schematic for the uh, reader controller and put it in the FPGA. And so anything that was time insensitive, so address encoding, skip logic, interrupt, and things like that, is all done in the FPGA. And emulating the paper tape reader itself is done in uh, software. So the uh, ARM that's in the FPGA runs Linux. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I put a 32-bit GPI go part in the FPGA, connected that up to the input and output for the reader punch. Uh, so if you uh, read a character from the paper tape reader, it generates an interrupt and will fetch a Linux device driver to talk to the FPGA and then go to uh, Linux application and you can read a flash file image of the paper tape and feed it to the device. Mm -hmm. And I got that working on the owl and I was running more than 3,000 characters a second. So focal loads in one and a half seconds or something like that. Uh, and then I got an AE and said, okay, I'll do it bigger this time. So I got the larger version of the FPGA and an omnibus interface for it. Uh, same paper tape reader inside of it. Got that working. Um, 
since all of the uh, non daybreak devices have fundamentally the same I.O. logic inside of them, that I can just copy paste uh, paper tape uh, I.O. that I've got to make a serial port or a line printer or pretty much anything, and then stack all of those up in there. And then it's just another Linux device, another device driving another application. And that's enough horsepower on the Linux on that to emulate you know, all kinds of purples. So emulating the diskettes would be easy because that's not a data version device. Yeah. Uh, um, the uh, ARM's also got analog I.O. on it. Uh, so uh, emulating a VCAE uh, graphics controller would be possible. You could actually probably emulate everything that the lab AD does, which would be kind of fun. So what's the status in terms of they work on it a while and been busy on the 12 and a bunch of other projects that he's haven't touched it? Yeah. Is, is the source available? I have it. What I should do is uh, set up a GitHub site for it and at least publish it. Yep. And, and a lot of projects like that that I should publish. And do you have a CAD layout for the board as well for the uh, Omnibus interface? Uh, yes. <coughs> That's in, it's a different set. You need a different set of people. It's not a CAD layout. It's just a schematic. I used a Douglas uh, prototype oh, yeah. for the base and just wired it. So it was the eventual idea that I do a print circuit. What am I up to? That's a good question. <clears throat> um, Spy. Well, <laughs> yeah, if you go out there, you can see my. PDP 8M blinks and individually addressable LED strings. I had that working, I guess, a couple of years ago around Christmas time. So I strung it up on the Christmas tree and put a little bow on top of the PDP 8 so mom would be happy. And, well, she still wasn't happy because of the fan noise associated with it, but close enough. So I, uh, I don't know. Recently, I've been playing a little more with SimH and. I think SimH is a great platform to play with the PDP-8 on, but it does not support all the peripherals that we know and love, especially in AM radio. <laughs> so I, uh, I added some real-time support uh, to SimH, and now I can play music over uh, simulated AM radio, which I can demonstrate here very briefly. This is running the latest code base. Uh, basically modified to make. So the only thing that's really missing is the uh, hiss of the AM radio and the fan noise, but I figured these are limitations that I can live with. So uh, I can also direct the output to a WAV file so that you can make your own CD, say, of, uh, of PDP-8 playing the Maple Leaf Rag, the Entertainer, and other various uh, tunes. So that's probably the one of the latest things I've worked on. How do you do it? How do I do it? Um, well, the, the short answer is... Um, what library am I using? Oh crap! Uh, Pulse real, Audio, maybe. The real machine's doing it with the CAF. I'm sorry. That's right. So, so the the source code for music is not modified. I'm basically taking that CAF instruction and in time creating an array where a one corresponds to the existence of a CAF instruction and a zero is not because that's effectively what's happening on the bus is you're generating a, a very short pulse, uh, what is it, 1.2 microseconds long or something. And, um, and that can be extended by a series of CAF instructions, which is exactly what the music program does. If you read the source code, they tell you that you can get a uh, monostable to extend the length of that pulse to make it sound better, as well as getting uh, diode and capacitor arrangement to do a little low-pass filtering and then output at line level or something like that. They mentioned that in the source code. So I kind of took that and created an array in, uh, in the, yeah, you know, I'm doing this all in C, of course, with the rest of SimH. And then I take that array, which is sampled at, 
I'm technically already doing a decimation, but we'll say it's at a megahertz. I do a down sample uh, to the 44.1 kilohertz rate that most sound cards would support. That is using the lib sample rate uh, library. Very, very straightforward. They've got a fairly fast way to do that down sample, which uh, allows me to keep real time. The other thing I had to add in was real time support. So effectively, um, every time an instruction is executed, it looks up in a little table how long that instruction would take on a real machine. Uh, that's just a, maybe 20 lines of C right there. So, so, keep so you, you have a lightning fast uh, simulation emulation, but the CAF instruction is forced to have the same speed as the original machine. Uh, every instruction has the same speed. The reason for the that is because in the music loop, there may be other instructions, and just for the ease of. But then you're forcing the whole PDP-8, the whole simulation, to be real time. Real time. Yep. So, and that was really a side effect. I didn't design it with that in mind. It just turns out to be a, a nice side effect. So. Yes, if you play any program on here, regardless of it being a music program or not, you will be running as if it were running at the speed of an 8E. Mm -hmm. Not yet. It's not prettied up. They won't accept my changes to the SimH repository yet. <laughs> I don't have it uh, to... So you need to set real time on and set real time off? Yes, and I haven't gotten there. I was hoping that someone else would be inspired enough to take my, you know, dirty hack and turn it into a pretty module for some age, but... We are. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, effectively, there's a, a support for multiple buffers so that it can kind of fill one buffer as the uh, Pulse Audio library is sucking it up. And so... Uh, so it will probably speed up and slow down, but on average, it's running real time. And I've got it released on GitHub. You can apply the patch to 4.0.0, and uh, you can play with it yourself if you'd like. You could use also this for to modulate, let's say, a spare pin of a Raspberry Pi. Yes. And I have thought about that as well. I don't know the speed at which you can uh, toggle GPIOs on the... Oh, very fast. Very fast. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. That'd Unless be you worth, use their libraries. That'd be worth playing with, yeah. Interesting. That'd be worth playing with. For our spring here, guys, you don't need to fly with much faster than about four kilohertz. Oh, it has wasted the idea. Do you guys, um, and maybe Mike too, or anyone else want to talk about space for a little bit too? Just. Uh, uh, yeah, where people are. I wrote a DC80 simulator in basically Java, just because it's. The only, I don't do a whole lot of GUI programming, so I figured that was a really easy way. Actually, a language called processing, which is a wrapper for Java, effectively. Um, but I just wrote a simple point plot display and ended up. I didn't want to hack SimH at the time because I had no idea what I was doing, but I knew that there were, uh, you know, auxiliary TTY ports available via Telnet. So I wrote the processing thing to talk over Telnet to send the video data, and then uh, from SimH to processing was the video data. From processing to SimH was eight bits of the controller data. So you know, low four bits were player one and high four bits were player two controls. And so uh, if you were running on real hardware, I don't think it would work very well because of the <laughs> serial uh, slowness. But effectively, if you had fast enough PDP-8 real hardware, you could. But um, I mean, you have to add, I took your code and uh, yep. I did a bit because uh, processing doesn't run up the, on the Raspberry Pi. If it's right. to, uh, so I made a little uh, yeah, C program that does the same as your processing uh, application. A little bit less beautiful, maybe, but it still works. Uh, and I, I hooked up uh, the, the, the controllers on the switches of the, the PyDP. So it now runs on the HDMI display of the uh, Raspberry Pi. And there's a guy not in the room here, Slop, I think is his nickname, that actually hooked up a, a proper uh, deck uh, to, to digital analog converters to actually run it on the scope, and that, that works. 
very good. And I have a method of, uh, that I've been trying to do, and I don't have the EAE set for my, uh, any of my eights yet, which is something I'd like to eventually emulate with the uh, CPLDs, perhaps, which we'll talk about with Vince here. Somebody has to do those string lines. I suppose that ends up being me. Well, <laughs> I might could help, you know. One, yeah. one little logic gate here and there. But, you uh, do that, you might as well do the FPP8 the same board. Yes. Yeah, I don't know too many people with the FPP8A, but uh, that'd be a nice uh, board. That's okay. That'd be a nice board to put at some point. That's, well. that's going to be a monstrosity. Yes, it's an export. I don't know what would be I don't easier even know to. How many layers that is? Yeah. It's, it's a four-layer board. I, it's very delicate traces, so I, it may not be a four-layer board, but it's it it's spectacular when you actually look at you know how packed it is and how large it is. And, you know, I'm just like, oh man, there's a month's work. It's just a hex wide board that, if it were quad wide, could work in any right. Right. bus, right? Well, it'll work in an M if you got the M with the power supply in the back. And remove the fans? Right. Yeah. Well, or put them on the other side in case. Or we'll work on an ion steering board. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but, anyways, that would be a fun fun project, too, there to learn. But, um, but if you take an M1705, that's a dual buffered 12-bit output board. That is actually what I'm using to uh, bit bang spy. Um, I've also taken 10 bits from each port to a uh, DAC, which in my case existed solely of the R2, R ladder type. But I suppose you could go a little fancier route too. Uh, I was driving that and then had uh, that same board has a, a pulse output. It's like perfect for emulating VCAD because that can now be your intensify pulse. Um, so I had that working with the Kaleidoscope program. I could not for the life of me get it working with Space War after borrowing someone else's EAE. So I don't know if it was a problem with the EAE or if it was a problem with Space War. Something else. Oh yes, uh, and I had gotten some boards from someone else, uh, and all the revs were mismatched. And I tried to put the like ones together, and never got really anywhere with that either. So I just ended up returning those boards. Uh, and maybe someday I'll get a proper set or a simulated set. I've also tried, just for the heck of it, which may useful for diagnostics, uh, sending the EAE instruction along with the arguments over the serial port to SimH, which will then execute those instructions and send me the results back. Probably and faster than the FPPA. Maybe. And then you could compare that to a real uh, EAE. Um, I didn't really get anywhere with that yet, but it's, it's under development. If any of you other guys on the other side of the table have comments, please just pipe up. Yeah, just chime in. Because there's actually, there are about the same number of us as there are of It's hardly a presentation. It really is literally a round table. So. It's also possible that you don't know what we're talking about. I was supposed to be in here. In which case, feel free to. Free to, feel free to ask us to explain what the heck we're talking about. Yes. Do you know what PBA is? Yes. When I was in college and in a part time job, I didn't have to do anything with the words. It's a big one. It's a big one, too. True floppy. Yeah. You say it was on a cart. Was it a make system? Did it have analog to digital? Uh, Looked like a cell cart. No, just on a cart like a small <clears throat> like, oh. They have a wood grain top. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
guess it was a golf assistant or something. I don't know what the boss said before. Uh, it wasn't a production Still, if she's 80, 80 floppy left, then uh, that's the beginning of the collection. Yeah. <laughs> the rest is just like. Still have your eight-inch floppy? No, uh, it got trashed in the ah, Great yeah. Flood of April 2003. Oh, no. I went there, one of our master's thesis on the WT-78. Mm -hmm. I kept the floppies for 30 years. I was able to finally read them on the AD. I remember what we were talking about. My wife wasn't anywhere near as impressed as I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there is probably at least one person in the audience then that is unfamiliar with who I am and what I do. Um, but the, the older machines, including the 8s, are uh, built out of uh, flip chip modules. Over there, I, I drew a uh, a crude rendering on the whiteboard, um, but they're little print circuit boards, and you build up, and they were used very much like ICs are used uh, nowadays. And uh, instead of a print circuit board, they would have a custom wrapped backplane uh, with wire wrap. Uh, anyway, one of the things that, uh, well, the main thing this year that I have been doing is I have been struggling uh, to complete the uh, the. CAD drawings for every flip chip module that uh, sufficient information still exists uh, to recreate those drawings. Uh, at this point, um, uh, the negative logic modules, the R, S, and B series with the red, uh, with the red and blue handles are very nearly complete. There are seven, R, seven remaining R modules to draw. And all of the B and S modules have been drawn. Um, uh, I'm well into the M series. The problem with the M series is that it gets, with the magenta handles, gets very nebulous where to stop. Because uh, the, the modules get bigger and bigger, and then eventually they are entire Cubus cards, and you know, and then they get bigger yet, and they are Unibus cards, and they are all kinds of stuff that is completely unrelated to PDP-8, which is mostly my interest. Uh, and also, as the card area keeps exploding, uh, the amount of work involved for me to do such a drawing goes from about an afternoon's work to draw a single height card like the one that I sketched up there uh, goes very rapidly up to a week or two uh, for an omnibus sized card. Uh, and that and that is, you know, me as a retired person spending a significant number of hours each day, you know, four hours a day or something like that. And uh, so, you know, as the cards get bigger and bigger, I get less and less ambitious about wanting to do them. And uh, at some point, I'll just draw, have to draw the line in the magenta handles and say, uh, you Cubus guys and you Unibus guys are on your own, because there's just too much. There are too many different cards there, there are thousands of, uh, there are already, uh, I started typing in the list from the, from, the, from the deck modules list, and I'm up to about 1,200, and, and I uh, have, uh, I have entered through, I think it's about M300, and, you know, just, just creating a big long list of every module that might ever have existed is, is, is this enormous list. And of course, uh, the CAD database of the drawings that I do is a tiny fraction of that. Most, many of those modules have never been seen. You know, we, I have no idea what they look like or what they did or anything about them really because the schematics are lost. They, you know, what I have is the one-liner description from the modules list that says there used to be a thing and you go, great, 
We went through a whole box of really weird ones. Okay. Ah, I'll well. I'll send you the list. Uh, yeah, and and Those and the full wide four digit ones. Uh huh. I have a few of those, but yeah. And uh, and some of the long skinny ones uh, that Those were that were very popular in the smaller 11s, um, you know, uh, if they're flip chip modules in the sense that you use them with a custom wire wrap backplane to build something, I might be interested in drawing them, even though they have nothing to do with the PDP-8. I've already drawn uh, many many modules um, uh, for you know PDP-15s and and uh, PDP-10s and stuff like that. Most of the blue series. Uh, for instance, has very little to do with the PDP-8. Is that true? TU-27 blue modules? Yeah, a couple, <laughs> but... Does the TCO-1 have a blue modules? Uh, I, I believe I have seen a TCO-1 with a blue in it, but it's not clear that it's yeah, actually it's a required. Or something. Yeah, it's yeah. It's the same one as the TCO-1. Uh, maybe, maybe. Uh, I'd have to look again, but... Um, Anyway, that's what I've been doing, and I've, I've been trying, in a sort of desperate but kind of feeble way, uh, to get some closure on that project so that I can feel good about it and move on to something else. Um, it's happening, but it, but it will probably, at this point, I would have to probably admit that it is re unrealistically optimistic to finish this calendar year. So. Anyway, that's mostly what I've been concentrating on. Well, I did do I did do some um, I did do some spice modeling. I, I wrote some tools that would move the eagle drawings that I have done uh, essentially into the into the spice world. Uh, so they, they take the eagle drawing, they suck it up, and they look and they and they create an equivalent LT spice schematic. Um, now that a schematic is not necessarily a model, uh, but it's a start, and you know, and certainly to do actual LT spice modeling of the uh, of the flip chips, you have to put instrumentation around. You have to be able to generate appropriate input signals and and look at appropriate output signals and decide whether they're correct or not, and you know this, that, and the other thing, and eventually you get to the place where. You have all that, and you think the inputs and the outputs are correct, and therefore the model is working. Um, and of course, uh, if you've got a thousand modules, you're, you're talking about uh, a man year. at least a man year's worth, probably two, um, to get all those models working. Um, and I'm not saying yet. Yeah, there's one of our early attempts, um, and, I, and I'm not saying that I want to tackle that project next. And, and, and frankly, my, my skill set is inadequate to the job. I do not know enough uh, electrical engineering uh, to be any good at it. Um, yeah, yeah. All right. Ta tackling them one at a time works works pretty well. And, we, we, I, and I've worked with you on some of that. And I feel like we, we can get a handle on it, you know, sort of piecemeal. But trying to do a blanket thing, um, especially on my own, is, is just beyond my, my skill set. I, I don't have uh, the necessary electronic skills to be able to create the models of the components that uh, were used. And you know, a great many quite obsolete components were used. And you know, you have to try to find a data sheet, and then you have to try to understand how to turn the data sheet into the proper models so that the differential equation solver can simulate the part. I, certainly for, for the modules that are meant to be logic, I, I think that doing logic simulation is, uh, would be more fruitful. I, unfortunately, I haven't found I don't know. Well, if we if we can come up with Verilog, I would say the, the free and open source simulation route would be Verilog. But is that actually a spice simulator? No, it is it is a digital logic. In fact, I do not think it supports Verilog A, which would be maybe a choice for the high end uh, simulators that do support mixed signal analog domain. But 
That said, LT spice can do some. Here is a flip flop that is wired up as a spice simulation of the electrical behavior of the part or something the, Yes, but uh, but spice does have a provision for that. It's right. just that digital it, is still analog. It's still, it, it's still kind of tricky. <laughs> so uh, there's stuff like the the um, uh, controller work, uh, timing work for the eight and eight down. I wanted to understand what that ring power is actually doing when you're solving that eight on one machines, mm -hmm. and you, you get little partial block diagrams in the maintenance manual, and you get a few abbreviated timing diagrams, but there's no big picture that tells you exactly clock by clock how that board is working. And that would be a very, very useful thing to have to say, okay, you know, five clocks later, this should wiggle. Yep. And none of that documentation exists. If we had a logic simulation, I mean, that board's not that complicated. And doing a logic simulation of that board, I think, would be very initiational. So there's another free and open source thing. I think it's Java-based, which is sort of unfortunate. but. If you have some basic logic gates, you can throw it at it, and it will gladly simulate. <coughs> that's that's all fine and good until you start looking at some of the PDP-8 stuff. The uh, 7453 model. And well, and sometimes you can come up with those models, but when you start seeing crazy stuff, like in the front panel board of the 8E, where they are driving, driving. the outputs as inputs. Mm -hmm. If you try and replace those, you know, flip flops or whatever with uh, the logic simulator probably wouldn't like that. No. Nah. And if you start replacing those with uh, modern components, they, they will anymore. not work because they are not wired the same internally. So uh, I would say I would love to see a uh, cycle accurate you know straight eight for instance which could be done Certainly, Verilog, module by module, much uh, like we've done uh, with Spice. Yeah, so the, far. Neg the negative logic stuff. The clocking is all one thing. I don't. I don't. We would definitely have to brainstorm about how to what yeah. to do about the clocking. Yeah, because let's get that working. Then you can just load it in an FPGA. Yep. Yeah. But I mean, this shows that we can certainly simulate a single flip flop. No problem. Does not break a sweat for LT Spice, and hopefully this can pave the way also for uh, some more advanced flip chip testers. Yeah, that can memory cards for LT is pretty easy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you want to jump in? Yeah. Try to get down the line and come back. To um, I don't think I've got much more to add. We. About a year ago, we did that work on the ATF one five zero eight CPLD yeah, card, which was if you still have it. Really. Uh, so, made a there's a prototype board floating around. <clears throat> this one here that uh, Alan did the layout for. Mm -hmm. um, so this is essentially a single chip sitting on a PCB that plugs straight into the omnibus, and then we um, did some coding in couple to simulate a KLED. Uh, serial uh, serial line unit, RS232 interface effectively, and, um, and that fitted in there quite easily. So that's essentially a single chip replacement for a KL8 e board um, with programmable, uh, through the dip switches you can program board rates, I think from 110 board through 230k, is that what we got to? I believe so. Yeah, and um, a couple of us have been using that to run serial disk, reasonably high speed. So. Yeah. Um, that was only ever intended to be a prototyping board, so it hasn't been written up as a project or, or anything else at this stage. Um, and we were looking at next steps in terms of what to do with that, whether to put two or three of those on the board so you could have two or three serial ports, perhaps, and maybe some prototyping space to do more work, uh, but haven't really taken it much further at this stage. Uh, that's really the only eight related project I've been working on. I've been doing some other things for 11s in the last 12 months. Um, I've been tinkering with Make 11s. There doesn't seem to be too many people that, that um, do much with Makes, but uh, the, one of the things that I've run into is, is a lack of uh, good documentation about the CSRs uh, that, you know, the 
there's pretty good documentation on the LPS 11s for units, <coughs> but on the make cards, I think they're relatively the same as like a KWV 11C, that sort of thing that the, they match up. But I've basically been trying to, uh, to reconstruct some of the documentation. I worked with uh, someone in the Netherlands also has a nice make page, and just even the basic eight book set didn't exist, and he had that, so they've been able to scan it and uh, get it into the uh, into the net. And fortunately, all of that work is done just out of basic calls. What I really want to be able to do is understand the uh, you know, some of the things that you know you would get at it with uh, macro and some of the higher throughput things. Uh, there's a really good set of uh, macro 11 programs that's that's part of the RSXs or. Uh, source code, uh, it's in uh, directory 4510, and it's for the K-series uh, cards, which are like the DRV11 and the uh, or DR11, some of those, and so there's some good example code there. And I'm just, again, just trying to make find out, does that code match the registers that you get with uh, some of the things in the MINK? Uh, the MINK itself has been modified quite a bit. It has a UC07, and uh, Boots DU, I borrowed some uh, some uh, 1123 uh, EEPROM code from Malcolm and, and worked the eight EEPROMs and modified so it can run 1103, 1123, or even 1173. And uh, then a little SD card on the front. I took one of the, the blank panels and made a silicone mold of it and then ported epoxy to make a replacement so that I could cut a hole and, and get the SD mm card to come out the front. So you can simply pull the card out, turn it off, pull the card out, and switch from one operating system to the other. What I'd really like to do is ultimately run an RSX11M on the make and have these drivers through it. Um, I would have heard that there was an RSX11M uh, thing created once by DEC. It was that came out of their custom shop or whatever, and uh, that code doesn't seem to be around. But the laboratory Subroutine package exists, the scientific subroutine package exists, uh, both documentation and, and code. So uh, that's what I've been looking at. What about uh, you guys in the audience? Anybody else doing anything? Nope. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many of you folks knew Warren Stearns. Um, a lot of us did. And uh, we met prior to PCF Southeast in April. Uh, worked out at Lottie Mims Museum, spent a good week with Warren getting his AI running. And then uh, came back and unfortunately Dawson had to leave early, but there were a couple guys down from uh, University of Minnesota Duluth who had been bringing P2P12 back up. And Warren actually spent, I guess, ten, 10 days, a couple weeks? Three weeks. Three weeks. Um, you know, that his own expense. Trucked himself down here and said, I'll help you guys. Well, I um, volunteer. <laughs> um, and so they got the machine running, and then shortly after that was done, he returned home and, and died. Uh, remember the date? I don't know. It was uh, during West. Yeah. So it was like uh, the first day of West, I think. <coughs> so um, it's a great loss to all of us. Warren, if you didn't know him, um, was just a, a really sweet guy with a tremendous amount of knowledge, and all he really wanted to do was fix AIDS. Uh, he spent two and a half years of Saturdays working. So um, we actually some got together. We put together uh, a little bit of an award to bring the guys from Duluth down here for the show. Uh, like I said, they had to leave early. But hopefully they'll have a, a presentation on their 12 next year. And with any luck, they'll actually bring the machine down. So we've got actually Dawson and one or two other kids up there in Georgia. Uh, so it's nice to have some funny song things that are famous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's the next generation after Kyle. Yeah. <laughs> so there's some moment for keeping this stuff going. Um, Their intent for the machine is actually to do benchmarking with that machine compared to other more modern machines like 2 e 6 they're having a uh, <coughs> challenge with that because the uh, original um, Westone Chrysome 
benchmarks were written in alcohol. And alcohol for the eight exists. I found a paper, a full set of papers for it in our warehouse last week. Uh, and, and the documentation from PICAS exists, but it's missing. There's got to be another 20 pages of the documentation someplace because there isn't enough in the DCAS docs to use it. I mean, I have the compiler running, I can compile code, and it does stuff, but then there's like four more tapes that have libraries and an operating system and things that you have to mix in with this somehow, and there's no documentation about it either. So that makes alcohol somewhat useless on that. Yeah. And, uh, only whetstone, dry stone stuff that we've been able to find so far were written for Fortran 66, which seems to be more advanced than the Fortran 4 that's on the 8, and uses pointers and a bunch of other things that the 8 doesn't support. So we're having a, a little bit of a challenge trying to uh, aggregate the uh, whetstone, dry stone benchmarks so it will actually run on the 8. Yeah, and uh, Dawson was learning a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Because he was amazed. I mean, he's out of the Fortran. Huh? Yeah, not really. Not really. But they do have Fortran running the Civ H. Uh, on the, not Civ H, sorry, Serial Disk on their uh, ball and some sort of this line. If they didn't have Serial Disk on that thing, it would be fairly useless. That's the way all my eights are. Useless for them. Yeah. And uh, somebody was generous and donated a clock board and some serial port cards for it. And then uh, the other thing we could talk about just a little bit is uh, PQA. And I'm sorry to ask him what all that is. Uh, I have the latest version running on the AI. Okay. 4K. Wow. And will it load from serial disk? GCO8 or GCO1? That's the version. Okay, so you're running off deck 10? Yeah, GCO1. And you don't have uh, a serial disk support for that yet? Dr. Charlson, that one. Yeah, it's going to be real soon now. So, we'll Charles, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know enough about it to be able to get the operating system for other drivers. Do you just have binaries or do you have a compilable source? Uh, binaries. Yeah. He just sent me a, he built a bootable uh, tape on the set and then mailed it to me. I used uh, dump rest to uh, make the tape on the I and booted it up. And what does Victor have? Because Victor's had a PQA tape for years, right? Uh, yes, he's probably 30 years or something like that. There's older versions that have floated around. Uh, I just haven't done much of the time. But it does run. We've been running DMS on the uh, AI since we first got running. DMS is fairly limited. And PQS is actually a kind of a useful operating system. It's pretty amazing that it'll actually run. Okay. Have you guys been working with Pepsi or any of the other bits and pieces that has been going on? I am not. I'm still a little worried about the Pepsi. Yeah. 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 I'm still a little unclear as to why uh, why is Windows a dependency for, for Charlie. Because he knows more about than anybody else and he's real helpful. I think there's a widespread urge, need, might be a little strong, but there's a widespread urge for uh, essentially uh, an IDE that will help you do cross-development or some kind of development for the, the 8, uh, because building native is such an incredibly slow